when you travel to some part of the world, such as the coastal cities in South France, Italy, or Spain. You see vendors selling paintings of certain all too familiar styles. They're familiar, but we cannot quite put our fingers on their sources. Those painting styles are some of those things that have merged into our blood so thoroughly that we have taken them for granted. It is like reading Voltaire. In fact, we have all but stopped reading anything by this popular writer of his time. I mean, anything in the 98 volumes of his complete works, because we take his ideas for granted, as if we were born with it somehow. From our last episode, we saw that nothing was automatic for Cezanne, who struggled all his life, rarely knowing where he was going, or whether he was on the right track. Even after he painted in the styles that will be ubiquitous in the future, he considered many of them his failures. All he knew was to plow ahead with everything he got. As we've seen in the last episode, that's what he did to his last day, or at least the day before he died. Monet thought that Cezanne was, and I quote, a bricklayer who paints with a trowel. For Cezanne, the impressionist brushstrokes, as we have seen in the past episodes, were all too whimsical, not representing the essence of the objects. To get to the structure of things, he did not use broken brushstrokes to create an impression, but used the so-called constructive strokes, strategically and meticulously arranged to create geometric forms. While Cezanne listened to Pissarro to avoid black lines, he continued to focus on using contrast to define the outlines of objects when their points of contact are tenuous and delicate, according to his letter to Emil Bernard. Let's take a look at this Montan Saint Victor. First, obviously, this is another classical painting. Which merely tries to represent nature. Second, this is not impressionism, which, with loaded and quick brushstrokes, put abundance of prime colors on the canvas, sometimes in the form of impasto. Let's start here. We see almost three flat layers. Cezanne took out so much details and volume that the structures, such as the tree here, was almost like a painting on a flat wall. Over a few layers of field, we see that the mountain structure was also simplified. In Impressionism, we saw that the solid body was separated into small blots or quick lines of colors, almost hiding the structure underneath. Cezanne wanted to take out the superficial facades and show the structures, in order to show the solidity of the mountain as well as the field, and the trees, and so on. He realized that he needed to simplify the structures. With that in mind, if we look at the left side of the painting, Cezanne's structure becomes quite obvious. Same thing happens with the mountain. This is another mountain Saint Victor. We see that even when the surfaces are more fragmented, Cezanne used similar sizes to illustrate the solid objects. Look at these trees. Are they actually trees or green rocks? We don't really know what they are. We can probably say that this is a house. What can we say about these structures? Rocks or houses. By the way, comparing to the photographs, we see that structures everywhere were simplified. When Cezanne laid things out, he did it for the balance of the paintings, not the exact representation of the landscape before him. It could took him a long time to finish a painting, 
but he spent much of that time outside. In other words, he got his ideas from the nature. This was another in earlier stage. It appears that he abandoned it probably because it was not going in the right direction. This was another one. Now, after we know Cezanne's emphasis of structure, rather than the whimsical impressions of reflective light, let's look at these ubiquitous paintings that we take for granted. If you have experience buying paintings in those vacation spots, you know how the painters over-enhance colors, sometimes frivolously, to attract buyers. But after people take the paintings home, they will probably realize that the colors are so saturated that the paintings make their rooms noisy. If you have one of those paintings, compare it with this one. You probably will find this one more suitable for hanging on the wall. Look at the texture of water. It is more or less the same as the mountains and landscapes. In fact, the sky is also of similar texture. One thing that Cezanne realized was that the texture of the painting should be similar everywhere. Otherwise, it would be impossible to accomplish structural cohesion. The sky in this painting was made with similar brush strokes as the trees. Look at the sky here. We know that no sky takes this form. these white brush strokes, especially the blue ones here, were not copies of nature. You can say that since Cezanne was right-handed, this is the easiest move for him to put the paint on the canvas. Same happened with the trees, as we see the leaves do not grow this way. Look here. Are these some building parts, or simply color blobs, to give the entire painting some structural balance? With all that said, we see that the entire painting is coherent and very comfortable to look at. One of the painters who influenced Cezanne was Nicolas Poussin. We didn't cover him. Let me put up a couple of Poussin's paintings here. In Cezanne's own word, he wanted to do Poussin over again from nature. Look at how Poussin painted the solid volumes. If you're not sure what I just said, go back and compare with Cezanne's paintings. It may help to look in the correct chronological order. To understand a piece of art, it is important to understand the character of the painter, especially when you're looking at a piece of modern art. In the last episode, we talked about Cezanne's relationship with Emile Zola, also, at the beginning of this program, we mentioned the not-so-flattering comments by Monet. Cézanne spent the summer of 1894 at Monet's home in Givigny. Although I'm not sure exactly what happened, we know that he left suddenly, leaving behind several canvases. 
The amiable Monet could not handle him. The only person who could put him at ease was the professional politician Georges Clemenceau, who Cezanne met at Monet's home. For those who are not familiar with French politics, Clemenceau later became the Prime Minister of France and led France through some difficult times. I don't know whether you could see this awkward, humble, but extremely proud man from the paintings that we have shown so far. If you spend enough time and look hard enough, I think everybody could see that. Partly because there is something like that in all of us. No doubt, Cezanne was an inventive painter. The thing about invention is that it is often difficult only in making the invention. Once made, copying or practicing the invention is often quite easy. That's why we see this painting style of Paul Cezanne, cheapened and vulgarized to meet the vacationer's taste in so many places in the world. Cezanne's stories continue in the next episode. I'll see you then.